So we're here with Lincoln from Narara Eco Village and he's showing us his mushroom setup. So you guys have probably seen some of the stuff that I do in my own kitchen and we're leveling up. This is the next <laughs> level of mushroom cultivation. So Lincoln, do you want to tell us about yourself and how you got into this? Mm, absolutely, yes. Yeah, so I've been involved in mushrooms now for about four years. I think one of the, the local village people put on or organised for a, a mushroom course and a bunch of us did um, outdoor cultivation uh, and I think that just sort of sparked my interest and you know I've gotten to a point now where I love everything that growing mushrooms, photographing mushrooms, um, looking at mushrooms, finding mushrooms, talking about mushrooms. Um, my poor kids are doing school <laughs> assignments on mushrooms. Um, it's just my thing now. So. And they're everywhere. Fungus among us. Yes and I think, they, I think they say only about 10% of all fungus are fruit which is a mushroom and the rest of it's all underground and you don't see it. Yeah. Awesome. So, if someone wants to start mushroom cultivating on a big level to the point where I mean you're now able to provide the village with mushrooms, not yeah. just yourself. That's right. Yeah. That's so, right. what materials do they need? How much is all of this going to cost? How sustainable mm -hmm. is it? So this is a, just a hydroponics tent that I got online. Um, it's uh, I think it's uh, three three by two meters. Uh, and it was about one hundred and eighty dollars, I think, from memory. Nice. Uh, very simple. And I've just got LED lights. I got from Bunnings, um, and it was part of a uh, a mushroom club or a mushroom network of the National Mushroom Network, and they supplied the the shelving. Um, what I generally grow in is these buckets, uh, which I got secondhand from the sanitarium factory. Um, punch the holes in, and then I just grow majority of the oysters on sugar cane, um, sugar cane mulch. And it's just cold pasteurized with a bit of builder's line, so all materials you can get just from the local hardware store. Um, What's cold pasteurized? So cold pasteurized is where you use lime, um, and it increases the alkalinity, which just kills enough of the bugs for the mycelium to, to take hold. So you're sort of getting rid of it. So it just avoids the whole issue of having to pressure cook it <coughs> so or heat treat it. you're just grabbing your ordinary sugar cane and then just soaking it with some water and lime. O right? Overnight with some water and lime, exactly right. Yeah. Um, and then just strain it, shove it in the buckets and you the mycelium, I guess we'll talk about in a minute, the mycelium is just little grains and you just layer it up like a, like a lasagna, a little bit of sugar cane mulch, some mycelium, pack it all down and then you leave it for a couple of weeks at which point you move into here and it starts fruiting. So where do you get your grains from? How do you know what mushroom you're going to get? Good question. So there's a few places that sell them. Aussie Mushroom Supplies is probably the, uh, the most well known, but there are a number of others. Um, so I, I grow to the season, so this is not artificially heated or cooled. Um, and different mushrooms will grow at different temperatures. So depending on the time of year, it will depend on what type of mushrooms I grow. So obviously cooler weather um, mushrooms in winter and then the ones that like the heat uh, 30 degrees upwards I grow in, in summer because it does get a little bit warm here. So you get your grain from all the mushroom supplies, they send it to you and then you mix it into your buckets. That's it. That's it. And what about these other interesting ones we've got here? Yeah, so I do mix and match. Uh, I can get commercial bags. Um, I do have the option of making these bags if I want, but it's, it's a bit of a pain. Um, so again, a lot of suppliers uh, provide these. I get these particular bags from... Uh, Life Cycle, which is a, a great company out of, the, um, out of Byron Bay. Um, and they, they use the coffee grounds from, leftover coffee grounds from uh, coffee shops and pre-inoculate it and then just send me the bags that look, you know, maybe a little bit less white than this. Uh, and then once I f think that they're ready for fruiting, I'll just cut holes in them, okay. put them in here, and then the, um, the mushrooms will fruit. Okay. And you just get those in bulk and... Yeah, so they come in one and a half or three kilo bags, and um, the I, I guess the cost ratio or the, the revenue ratio is not as high because you, you're paying an extra third person. If you can make those, you can save a lot more money. Yeah. Um, and I, I find with some of the, the more exotic gourmets. So like, what's your exotic gourmets? Are those those ones there? Yeah, so these ones here are the Lion's Man, uh, which are very, very popular at the moment, but very fickle to grow. These ones are the king oysters, um, a little bit easier to grow and they're a big meaty substitute um, and they, again, they're a little bit fickle as well. Um, uh, so I do find with those more exotic, basically the, the non-oysters, which we'll talk about I guess, mm -hmm. um, they just 
it would be a hit and miss. I'm probably still refining my technique on those. So what if I have a mushroom that I've found somewhere and I really like the look of it, I really like the taste of it, can I put that into a bucket and get it to grow? Or is it a bit more complicated? It would be a bit more complicated. So there's uh, a process called stem butt propagation where you, you can take some of the mushroom. Mm -hmm. um, but generally you, you need more quantity of the, the, the mushroom base or the spawn. So you could, you could take that one that you really like and, and maybe put it in, soak it with some um, cardboard um, and then transfer that to grain and then the grain you use to bulk, bulk inoculate the uh, sugar cane mulch. Okay. Um, so you need, you know, you, you can't just get one mushroom and put it in a whole bucket like that because it's just, it'll get overwhelmed by the other bacteria that will eventually get into it. Um, and that's why oyster mushrooms are quite good because they're a, a very vigorous uh, grower. So you can put them in there and um, they will colonise all the, the substrate before any other bacteria gets in there and makes it go off. Awesome. All right. So what have you got in these rooms here? Can you show us that? Yeah. So have got two rooms. Uh, one here is what I call the lab. Um, it's luckily I've got, I've got the, the benefit that um, the Eco Village was a horticultural research station. So there's a lot of lab equipment that was left behind. And this is one of them. So this is the laminar flow hood, uh, and it's used for all the sterile work. So what happens is you turn it on. Uh, we've got a HEPA filter, or a pre-filter and then a HEPA filter inside, and then that sterile air coming out. So any work that I do in terms of agar plates or inoculating those bags after they've been sterilized, uh, I can do it here in a nice clean lab quality environment. Um, I've had it serviced and um, the guys were guys saying that these older units are really good because they're just mechanical, the new ones with computers tend to break down, and this is a workhorse. So this is where I'm going to do my work and I'll we'll do some work. And I've got... So why are they in the fridge? Just to slow them down, um, because they will run out of, out of steam. <laughs> and these are the agar plates. So agar is just a, a gel gelatin type material. Uh, and you put the spores or a little bit of mushroom on it and it will colonise and you can take a little bit of that and propagate that out. So, so if I have some spawn or if I have a kit and I don't, I'm not ready to deal with it, mm -hmm. can I put it in the fridge? Yes, yeah, so m most, most spawn will be fine in the fridge for three months or so, uh, but you need, do need to be careful with the warmer varieties like pinks. Pink oysters don't do well in the fridge, uh, mm -hmm. they will die at that lower temperature. Um, so th this is this is a, probably an advanced technique. Um, I'm still mastering it, um, but this is where you can control the whole supply chain, I guess, because you can go take the spores from the mushrooms to the agar plate to expand out onto the grain to move into the, the buckets of substrate, so you're not paying any third party costs. And I suppose you could get local varieties that way as well and improve your local genetics like we do with our seed bank. Well, not just local. You, uh, I've uh, got some mycelium in from Perth, for instance. I've got a, a, a Perth or a WA reishi, and that's to just to try out different genetics. Mm -hmm. um, so you can bring in different genetics from different areas. They might be uh, better, better suited or they might have some characteristics that grow better here. So there is a whole network of people swapping agar plates and swapping spores, yeah. and it is just like Seed Savers Network. Okay. And what kind of maintenance do you need to do with your mushrooms? Maintenance? Uh, not all that much. Do you have to water um, them? Do you have to take them out in the light or anything like that? No, so I guess the way that I've set it up with the shed is that the lights are on for 12 hours uh, and then off for 12 hours. I've got a humidity sensor on there that's all plumbed in, mm -hmm. um, and it will keep the humidity around between eight, 75 and 85 yeah. percent, uh, and that kicks in. So I can just leave leave that for a period of time and just check it periodically to see how it's fruiting. And just harvest. And then when it's ready to harvest, I pick them off and. And what take kind them of the... um, yields are you getting with this setup? Uh, I would get uh, probably about three kilos, uh, about one and a half kilos per bucket, mm -hmm. um, over a number of flushes. So. And these are all gourmet mushrooms, so... That's what they call them, yeah. Yeah, if you were to purchase them at Woolies, I'm trying to think... I'm, I never do, but I'm trying to think of um, how much they would cost. They're Be usually... Between $60 and $80 yeah. a, kilo, a kilo, yep. They're priced because they're light. They're light, yeah. yeah a kilo of mushrooms is, is quite a lot. Yeah, um, yeah 60 to 80 a kilo. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to try and sell them to the village members at 45 which which covers costs and and helps pull a little bit of the kitty to maintain the, yeah. the stuff. And how do you cook them? What do you do with them? 
Can you oh, preserve it? Depends. <laughs> it depends on, yeah, okay, so there's so many different ways to use mushrooms. Obviously, the, the classic quiche or the risotto, um, but you can dehydrate them and use them for later. Um, I haven't tried pickling them, but it's something I do want to try. Dehydrating um, with herbs and spices to turn into a bit of a chip, um, a vegan chip. Um, yeah, there's just so many different ways that you can use them. Um, I've got, I'm starting to collect old cookbooks, uh, of mushroom cookbooks, and just trying yeah. to understand the different ways that people used to cook with them and the idea being if I can teach people yeah. different ways of cooking them it's going to have you uh, eaten at Bon more. Pavilion down in CrossFit? No. Bon Pavilion have a dish called Orgy of Mushroom. Oh uh, yes. It's very good. I've, it been, is as it I've says. been trying to replicate that. Um, Just a mix of mushrooms. I feel like it's a lot of cream. That's what, yeah. I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm working out. I think when you look at those, the older 1970s type ones, I think it's cream, alcohol, and cheese, and yeah. you put that with anything, and you've got a 70s meal. But they they use the kings and mm. the enoki um, and the oyster. Mm. So enoki are really quite interesting because um, when p p people buy enoki, they're the long, thin ones that are very popular in the Chinese mm. cooking. Um, and they're actually a, an example of deliberately farmed mushrooms in the way that they grow them. If, if they were to left, left by their own devices, they would go out big, like mm. the traditional mushroom. But with enoki, they grow them in a, in a high CO2 or carbon dioxide environment. Mm. So they grow up and up and up, and you get that long, thin technique, and then they harvest them. So it's... Uh, a deliberately farmed mushroom. Yeah, I've got some in my fridge. There we go. Yeah. Growing or? Dirty? Yeah, yeah, they grow in the fridge. Um, and they grow better in the fridge. Because of cooler climate? Yeah, I tried mm. taking them out of the fridge and having them under the sink in winter. It didn't have a lot of luck. They pinned, but they didn't grow. Okay. Put them in the fridge, they just mm. shut up. So there you go. There we go. Good mm. tip. Good in tip. a jar, in the fridge in a jar, which is really confronting to people who visit me and open my fridge. <laughs> Uh, so, what was I, hmm, just space, what was I going to ask you about? Yeah, so we've gone with how you can cook them, and basically, I guess, what's your, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you trying to do this? Like, this is when it all goes right, mm. but what can go horribly wrong? Uh, I don't think there's much that goes horribly wrong. Um, you do get contamination there's mm -hmm. a, a common um, green mold called trichoderma that is a, a mold eating fungus mm -hmm. uh, or a fungus eating fungus really um, and if you get that in large amounts that can really ruin the, the whole harvest um, yeah. and you need to do a bit of a deep clean on the on the grow room yeah. to clear it all out um, but that's probably the worst you know occasionally you get a bucket that for some reason didn't colonize and you open it up and it's a bit stinky but that doesn't you know that's it's part yeah, of the process. Pretty much, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I, I don't think anything has gone horribly wrong. Mm. I haven't poisoned anyone. Yeah. I haven't died. You know, hasn't, any, anything like that. Um, yeah. It's been fine. Yeah, I haven't heard of anyone eating a bad mushroom in this state. Of course, there are poisonous mushrooms, but I think the only cases when you have wild, been... When you wild yeah. forage them, absolutely, there's some lookalikes. Mm. Um, Quite often there's the what the people will call a field mushroom. There's some um, quite toxic lookalikes that people harvest. Yeah, they've been in Victoria and Canberra, I think, are the two cases. Yeah, that we and we're, we're kind of lucky because those there's the three of them called the destroying angels, and <laughs> they do as they say. Um, they, mm. they really don't grow north of Canberra, so we don't mm. get them up here on the central coast. Yeah, um, so that's good. But yeah, quite often down in Victoria. And, Victoria. and they're distinctive. They're very easy to spot. And they smell differently. Yeah. I think that's when you're growing mushrooms as well. The mushrooms will tell you if, if they're not happy. You know, mm. if if they smell bad, they look bad. Um, but if they're growing and they're fruiting, then you know it, it's clean. They've, they've battled off any of the other uh, contaminants and they're, mm -hmm. they're fine. Okay. Do you have to, you don't have to apply any kind of sprays or anything like that? It's all pretty natural materials? Yep. Just yep. keeping it clean. I um I use probably copious amounts of uh, methylated spirits and isopropyl alcohol just mm -hmm. to try and keep the surfaces clean, particularly in the lab. Um, mm -hmm. And then anywhere I'm sort of taking the mm -hmm. the harvest and, and bagging them up, you know, clean my hands and wearing yep. a mask, you know, just the general mm -hmm. good things to do. What's your favourite thing about growing mushrooms? Uh, the, the the patterns that you get in them, you yeah. know, and the different sorts. You know, you get the kings that just have this beautiful large bulbous base and then you get the uh, contrast that to the the yellow oysters and they just mm -hmm. have these big brittle fragile clusters and i think and, and every every mushroom is going to be different you know mm. you get the same sort of form but they they end up looking different yeah and i guess a, an advantage to mushrooms over a lot of people in our group grow plants but 
one of the advantages to mushrooms is you can do it inside and you're not, right. you're not going to lose your whole crop to some hail. Or... That's right. Yeah. And, and people can be, and from permaculture principles, you can, you can get quite creative with your grow rooms. I saw an example a couple of months ago where they're, they're piping the humidity or the steam out from their bathroom and set the mushroom shed up on the outside of their bathroom oh, wall. That's used baker. East Bucco, Baker, I think he's Dutch. It. Yeah, I, I've seen it's that too. It's such a clever idea. Yep. And, and using that steam from your shower to create, and create humidity in, yeah. in your grow room. I think if you Google future food systems, mm -hmm. mushroom room, have it. Yep. You'll, that'll come up for you. Yeah, that was very clever, but... Um, it is super clever. And then, of course, um, so mushrooms release carbon dioxide, same as humans. Um, and I've seen examples where people take that carbon dioxide and pump it into their... Um, plant room mm -hmm. use the carbon dioxide so you can actually have this nice little cycle going. What's the best? So we know that they like humidity. What's the temperatures that you think are best for mushroom cultivation? Like, Could you do it in a tropical greenhouse or is that too hot? You could. You'd need to choose mm -hmm. the, the right varieties. Um, so the pink oysters, for instance, grow better in the warmer, warmer climates. Um, and there's, there's varieties of white oysters. Um, so you, you need to choose yeah. which one. So I've a lot of people have spaces here on the central coast who have kind of got pole homes and they've got kind of that cavernous space underneath, underneath. their home. Would that yeah. be appropriate, do you think? I think so, as long as there's enough airflow. Because of that carbon dioxide buildup and the humidity, mm -hmm. you do want to be flushing that that um, that environment out on a periodic basis. So in the grow room, I've got it set to, to flush the air out 15 minutes every hour and that just keeps it. So I think you've got to be aware of that. If you're going to be growing it in your in your laundry cupboard or something like that, you just need to be aware that it will be high humidity and high CO2, which is going to give it the right conditions for other type of mould and fungus. Yeah, and plants like the CO2 as well, so you could always put a few plants in there and, so and they'll I. recycle that for you as mm, well. Mm, yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to add? No. I get into it. It's it's <laughs> it's easy, it's fun, and it's uh, very rewarding. Are we going to have any more workshops here, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah now that COVID uh, restrictions have all lifted, I'd love to get some more workshops going on. Yeah. Um, everything from growing, I'd like to do some more log cultivation. Mm -hmm. So at some point, because we've got quite a lot of acreage around here, mm -hmm. there's some spots where I want to do some um, inoculate logs. And logs are a long-term investment because you can inoculate them now, they'll fruit in a year's time, but they'll continue to fruit for three or five years uh, left untouched. So if you just do 50 or, 50 or 100 logs every year, you're just building up that food security for the future. Awesome. I think we're all good.